So uh, um, when I was asked to, to give a series of lectures about uh, type 3 approach to surfactants, so I asked myself whether I should talk about the Tomita Takasaki theory, those serious type 3 things. I thought the answer should be no. What do you really want to hear is not a type, really type 3 approach, but sex approach, right? Yeah. So, um, well, Actually, so the sex approach was developed in the, well, its origin was in uh, quantum field theory, uh, algebraic approach of the quantum, quantum field theory. And uh, once you admit to just w one thing about the type 3 factor, namely, so any, any two non zero projections of a type 3 factor equivalent in the sense of Murray von Neumann, then, then that's it. You don't really need to use other, other deep stuff like the tax theory. And in a sense, so the theory, check the theory works even for sister algebras once you have that property. Anyway, so for, for, for example, for the Kunz algebra O2, it's a famous sister algebra, not von Neumann algebra, it's a purely infinite sister algebra. And it's known that uh, the K0 of the Kunz algebra O2 is trivial, meaning that uh, every non zero projections are mutually equivalent. And the sex theory works perfectly for O2. So I decided to, at least at the beginning, start with a more general setting, say, sister algebra setting. Then I don't really need, I, I cannot really use Tomita Taxak theory. So I don't need to explain that. So Bohm introduced a notion of index for subfactors of type 2 one factor. And uh, you, you've already seen that uh, Trace preserving conditional expectation plays a crucial role. So, but when you start with the inclusion of factors, type C factors, say, then there's no trace. Then what can you do? Well, you have to assume something else from the beginning. That condition, existence of conditional expectation. Let L and B be C star. So I start with C star. Then, what is the linear map? What is the linear map E in the conditional expectation? So it's uh, okay. So B is a subalgebra of A. So it's uh, A is a BB bimodule, and say E should be a BB bimodule. Map. So name is so you have this property. Preserve the unit. So, so this is the definition of the well, general conditional expectation. You don't need to assume the existence of trace. Okay. And uh, by the way, it's well known that I told me I'm a seven, so this is the same as uh, is a normal projection. In Banahat, let's say. But it's deep theorem. Okay, take this as uh, our definition of the conditional ex does, experiment. Does E1 equals 1 follow from the bimodule property? Because it's, a, it's a positive map. Positive map and uh, it's unit, so it's normal. Already normal. No, in, in that we just put uh, no, E1 1 should be a positive. Oh, so far. 
further questions? No, no, no. I thought even it was one of the consequences of bimodular property. Ah, not really. No. no. If you take A equal to 1 and B2 equal to B, don't you find that E of B equal to? That E raised oh. to A is identity, oh. that follows. Oh. Only that B. Oh, 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 oh. wait, wait, uh, wait. No, it's still. No, no, only on the range of, on E of B it is added. Oh, this is a, okay, no, no, no. Okay, okay. Uh, so if you, okay, consider multiple of these, still it is a BB5 multiple, but that, it's not unitary. Yeah. Anyway, so let me give you two easy examples. So uh, let G be a finite group. Let's consider G action. Then, uh, so you take you take the average <coughs> over G in the for instance. So you have a G action here. So you plug. This map, then this is a map from uh, is a map from yeah. from A to the fixed point also. It already appeared in Paul's talk. Then is a conditional case. It's easy to see. Ah, uh, it's easy to see that this is a positive map. It's a okay. It's a linear combination. What well, positive uh, convex combination of positive map. So it's positive, and it's unitary. Okay, convex combination in terms of it's unitary. And uh, yes, it's, it's clear, it's BB5 module. So this is a typical example, and uh, let me give you another example, which uh, is kind of dual of this situation. I told you with B equal to the fixed point. Yes, yes. B. What A, B. So, Let's consider the general situation, that's a cross product. So, so still alpha is G action. Then you can produce a new C star algebra or formal algebra or finally C star in fact. So this is a C star algebra generated by A and a copy of uh, the regular representation. A copy of regular representation. Satisfy the following condition. So this is a universal system algebra satisfying with generators and relations. So this is cross product. Then so by definition, any element here have expansion, unique expansion. Sometimes it's called a fully expansion. Here x g is in a. Then you can consider this map. So sending this to the delta g element. So let's call this map, uh, say, e1. Then this is again a conditional expectation. So you want the conditional expectation. So again, it's easy to see that you want that satisfy these conditions. Right. So these are typical examples. And uh, in a sense, E and E1 are dual to each other. I'll explain what it, it really means. Right. So let me give you. Okay, let's consider this situation. So E is given. So A and B are sister algebras. E B is a sister subalgebra of A, and uh, they they share the common unit, and A is a conditional expectation. Then we say that E of uh, I 
uh, index file type. Right? If there exists a finite subset, you run u2 to un in A, satisfying the following property that for any any x has a foreign expansion. And since A is A the C star algebra and E is a star map, so if you take this star of this equation, then you get another another equation automatically. So whenever E has such a system, such an element, such an element, then uh, you say that E is of index finite type, and actually you call this a uh, basis. Uh, strictly speaking, I should say that it's basis of A over B with respect to, to E. I should say something like that, but I just say that uh, this is a basis for, for E. Or strictly speaking, I should say seems not of this. Actually, uh, well, probably it's, uh, so Bond is not here. So <laughs> if he, he's, he were he's here, here, then uh, he would say that it's not fair to assume the existence of basis from the beginning. <laughs> but, uh, well, actually I can talk about the uh, index, the index of uh, conditional expectation of the type three factor without referring to the, this basis, but, but it's, this is the easiest way to, to get basic expansion, well, index, basic expansion, and so on, so on, algebraic construction. So let me assume it's the existence of basis from the beginning. Then, uh, okay, one easy fact about this basis is the following. So this number, uh, not really a number, it's an uh, L. Of the C star algebra A. So this is A always belongs to the center of A. And in fact, it does not depend on the choice of U. Definition of this term so of index finite type is just the equidistance of one basis. And in general, so there are many, many different basis for one conditional expectation. Yes? So, sorry, can you just briefly, for those two examples, so I can imagine the basis for one of them would be something like a lambda G. So yeah, yeah. Yes. So what's the one for the top one? Well, in general, actually, the top one doesn't have a basis in general. Oh. When A and B are factors and alpha, well, A and B are factors, then there is there could be a basis. But, the, but, uh, but this is, okay, this is really nice thing. But uh, for that, then that, 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 that's just the existence. You can show the existence. But, so you can show the existence. but you don't really have a canonical basis. And for the general C star algebra, then you actually, so there is an example where, okay, this E doesn't have a basis. It's, it's related to the uh, freeness of the action for C star algebra. It's very subtle. Right. So. So the bottom, sorry, just so that I've got the text, the bottom example, oh, E is always a finite type. Right. But the top one, not necessarily. It depends on the property of alpha. For general, 
this algebra. For Pacta, this is the case. Right. Uh, so this is a statement. And it's really an easy computation. So well, this is a, well, let, let, let me prove it. It's very easy computation. So assume there is another basis. Assume this is also a basis. Then, uh, so let's try to compute this. Ah, yes, we want to know. This does not depend on the choice of this. But uh, what well, we, we, we showed, so, so this statement contains two, actually two statements. First, this is in the center, and the, the second one is that uh, this doesn't depend on the choice. So let's try to prove the two statements simultaneously. So let's, so we compute this by, by expanding this part using VJ. Okay. So and for that, we use this. By VJ. Ah, uh, yes, VJ. Right. Now, uh, so I should put some here. Now I change the, the order of some here. Yeah. Okay. And here I use uh, something wrong. Star. Yes. Then I use the basis property of UI here. Then uh, I end up with uh, yes. This. Right. So you just look at the, the first term and the last term. If you put x equal to one, then it means that it gives you that okay, this summation is the same as that summation here. So, so this element doesn't depend on the choice of the basis. And once you know that, then this this equality means that this summation is in the center of a. So. It's a really easy computation. And the, actually, the, the idea was, <coughs> I, mean, I think it's, uh, well, it's, I should, I should say, Pim Sunakopa, and also the uh, idea of Watatani is that uh, to define uh, index for general inclusion, then uh, let's, let's do so this number. So we call this the index of U. Uh, Watatani. W means, well, so Watatani proposed that uh, to define the index of general inclusion by using the basis in this way. So I put W. And uh, I have a few remarks, of course. So when A and B, say A and B are two factors, and uh, E is a price preserving functional expectation, then this, well, first of all, so this is a central element. So when B, A is a, cent a, is a factor, then it's scalar. Then this definition, of course, coincides with the uh, original definition. And uh, uh, first of all, I, I, I should show that uh, there, is, there exists a basis, but that's what Pimson and Popper did. What did that mean? Oh, sorry. Yes. 
So Pim San and Popper show that there is a always a basis and uh, this number coincides with the Jones index. And uh, yes, actually already Zef this asked me about this. In uh, this is only the finite technique scale. So what? This is only the finite technique scale. Yeah. So it is under the assumption that the index of B away is finite. Ah, uh, of course. I yeah yeah. So you can you can relax this condition a little bit. You if you allow a series of elements. So this is just a finite set in the definition. But if you allow a series of definition, then uh, yeah, sometimes you get a basis in just in, in the case case of uh, infinite index in the usual sense. Yeah. In that case, this number is infinite. Right. So, so in this example, in this case, then uh, it's clear that uh, this is a basis. This is a basis. And the index, in this sense, okay. in this sense, is uh, uh, this number, and this is nothing but a cardinality of this. Right, and uh, we are therefore already asked about this situation a bit, bit uh, subtle. But when A and B are factors, then there is a basis. Using the fact that actually, so this action is the second dual action of something, then you get a basis. Again, you get the same number for the index. Right. So this is one way of defining index for general case, but uh, there is another way. That that's uh, what the PIMS and the POPA propose. So I, I'll mention it briefly. Uh, right. So there's another easy lemma. So if E is, if e is a conditional expectation from A to B and where is the basis? Then you have this is equality. So this one. So since this is just a central element, set norm and identity. So you regard this as a map, linear map from A to A itself. B is a B is a sub algebra of A, so you can regard E as a map from A to A. So it makes sense. Then, actually, this is a positive, positive map. <coughs> That's what uh, Pimus, uh, Pimus and Popper first showed. Actually, this is also easy and nice argument. So to get used to basis, well, argument with basis, then uh, I think it's, it's nice to have C this, this proof. So in this case, how can I show this? So let's assume x is an element of A, then uh, we have a, well, the following different uh, expansion. Yes. So every positive element of A can be written as an xx star. So let's complete it. Okay. And here, you have a nice matrix, operator matrix. So 
Um, so let's, let's, let's consider this matrix, operator matrix first. So this is in uh, here. The visual term to be changed from UA star to UG? Ah, oh, right, right, right. Okay. Yes, this is the right order. Yes. Yeah, this is the right order. Right. So let's consider this matrix. Then here, what appears here is that uh, Okay. Right? Yes, yes. So if you consider the IJ component of this matrix, V star T, then this is nothing but uh, UI star V star. So let's con con uh, compute the other product, V V star. Nothing but you uh, are your star. So this is the uh, index. Right. So this computation shows that the norm of this matrix is yes. the norm of this matrix is. Uh, nothing but the index. Oh, e. And since this is a well, clearly positive matrix, so we have this thing called. And a time diagram. So using this inequality, in general, you cannot really reverse them, but uh, say in a good situation like uh, when A and B are say simple systems, or when A and B are factors, then so if this number is finite, then so there, there is there is a basis. It is basis, and these two number coincide. Equal. Well, in these two cases, then uh, this is a not a, well. So then uh, the center of A is trivial. So this is a scalar. So the two number coincide. So, so you don't in place in the what? You mean if the provisional property index is finite, then the other thing. Ah, okay, all right. I should write this way. Yeah. So under under either this condition or that condition, then if the probabilistic index is finite, then it implies the existence of basis and the coins the two numbers coincide. And this requires a proof. It's, it's not really simple. But I skip it. It's not a really point of this series of lectures. What does P stand for? P probabilistic or P Whichever. What? P, P, P. P, 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 yeah. <laughs> To make spring happy, I should be. <laughs> any, any. Actually, two one factor is automatically simple system. Like three factor is also simple system. But two infinity or B of H are not simple system. Still. So that's the same thing as saying if the index is. Infinite is 
So the, the, the easy one is uh, with what I already proved, okay. or so <laughs> I right. proved. So existence of basis implies Kingston upper inequality. So the sister algebra that must be required. But uh, for, yeah, general, for general sister algebra, or well, well general, say, for normal algebra, Kingston upper inequality does not assure the existence of a finite basis. If you allow a sequence, then uh, you could use it. So, so since I mainly work, I mainly work on type three factors, so I don't really need to distinguish these two. Right. So, yeah. So, are there any questions up to here? Is everything clear? Good. So now. I should talk about the basic concepts. Where can I see a proof of that fact? Ah, uh, this one? Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, well, in the case of two-run factors, then it, it's a uh, pim snap offer. Yeah, no, no, it's a simple system. Simple system, I don't know, but uh, that's my own view. Yeah, but where can we see that? Uh, it's, uh, it appeared in Kurev's uh, journal, yes. So, Pimpson and Poppy use this semi continuity argument, not the semi continuity signal or something. What do you use for? Actually, I use the. Actually, I. There is a paper of uh, French people, three French people. Oh, you're right. Abe, yeah. Abe, yeah. They treated the general von Neumann algebra case. Uh -huh. So then I use the second view argument. Yeah. Right. Right. Any relation with the CV norm? Sorry? CV norm? Completely bounded norm. Uh, I think, in, well, I think the positivity is uh, crucial here. Right, so Bon already talked about basic construction. Since it's very important, and this is the first lecture of my so I, I keep at least this lecture very elementary, so I start with well, basic construction. I mean, I'll give you the details of basic construction general case. All right. So the situation is this. So I already assumed this situation. There is a condition expectation and also basis. So before you, before you enter this room, I said that if you, you're here, then uh, it's not, for, you might say that it's not fair to assume the existence of basis at the beginning. But uh, once, once you assume the existence of basis, then uh, I, I don't really need to talk about Tomita Takisak theory at all, at all. So everything is algebraic once you assume the existence of basis. So, once today still I'm, I'm in the sister algebra setting, so. so Okay, the basic idea is of course the same uh, as Bon already told this morning, yesterday. But uh, okay, I'll give you the detail. So since A is a, okay, write B module, okay? So, so I use a different no notation for A as a write B module. And I also use this. So for element, well, just, just to, uh, to ab avoid the confusion, so I use a different notation for it. A. But this is not only 
A module, but it's so called the Hilbert A module. Namely, so there's a nice B valued in a problem. So you can introduce it. B valued in a for this way. So this is a B value. So it looks like an ordinary inner product, but uh, this is not a scalar. It's, it's in B. And the Pimsner Popper inequality shows that we have this, well, it's equivalence of norms. This is nothing but the premise of Popper inequality. So, this shows that uh, at the Banha space, so Okay, as a normal space, this is already a Banha space. So with respect to this norm. So this is a standard norm for uh, Hilbert module. So this is the Banahan space. And so, well, and this is so-called, what's so-called uh, Hilbert, uh, Hilbert B module, Hilbert system module. And there is a nice theory about the Hilbert system modules. Namely, so you can consider a kind of bounded operators of, say, B, okay, bounded operator with an adjoint operator. Then, then you get a sister algebra. Uh, so let me define this space, this algebra. So this is a, is a set of T. is a bounded operator on this Banha space, such that there exists a some bounded operator T star, it's a joint. Such that, right, T star A1, A2 is equal to well, I didn't put E here, sorry. It's confusing. I should put it here. Uh, ah, okay. This is not. This is the so-called set of adjointable operators. And actually, this condition automatically assures that T is a right, right B module map, automatically. So any element here is a right B module map. And there is a nice theory about uh, Hilbert system module. It says that this is, again, a C star algebra, automatically nice C star algebra. And in our situation, when okay, we start with a von Neumann algebra, then actually this is a von Neumann algebra structure automatically. It's called a self dual double star module. So, yeah. 
self W star module. I think Pashke Pashke introduced it. Yeah. Right. Then other holy bone holds you. So there is a natural obvious inclusion here. Namely by left multi multiplication. And also, so the condi conditional expectation E itself belongs here, but I, I don't want to use the E. Well, I want to use this notation for the conditional expectation. This is so-called Jones projection. They, well, they satisfy the obvious relation here. So this is a very easy computation. Right. And uh, well, I, I erase the definition of basis, but uh, the, the definition of the, the basis I introduced is nothing but the following equation. So we actually have this equality. So this is nothing but the, you know, writing in a different way of the, the definition of the basis property. So if you apply the left hand side to say eta A, then you immediately see that it's, it's identity. Right, and uh, actually, so it's really nice to have this, this equation. So this gives you everything. So everything is algebraic due to this, this equation. So, and the important, so the most important, well, statement along this line is that, uh, so, so let's call this, so this is a bit complicated. So let's call this A1. Then the point of the basic construction is that uh, this is nothing but, so this is, well, since I use a theory of C star, it looks like a, you know, analysis is involved, but it's not the fact. It's not really the case. So this is, determined algebraically. So, so I'm going to show this. This is a really important property. So it's as, at least as a linear space of say A by modules, then this is nothing but the module tensor product over B. So I think uh, my goal today is to show this. And then uh, once you get that, then you get a dual conditional expectation automatically, well, almost automatically. Okay. Yeah, is uh, equal dimensional or what is it? That is the equality of different modules. Yeah. I I'll show you the real meaning of this, but uh, yeah. Okay. So, again, I'll show you a very easy computation. So for any T in A1, we have this foreign expression. So T can be expressed as this. Say T I, E, uh, U I, UI. U I or U S star, star, it's star. Where 
Pi is determined by this relation. Uh, yes. So since you know you don't really need to take completion or anything, so this is as I said. Then our Hilbert module is just A itself, so it makes sense, right? Well, this is really easy. Oh. Well, you, you just compute this, okay? Then using the base property and so on, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. This is well, probably the other way is more, much more easy. So let's start. Let's compute this. Then you, what you do is you expand the a by using the module property, uh, basis property. Uh, yes. And since, okay, this is a right B module, so, and T is a right B module map. So you have this, say, right. And uh, yes, you can make this, right? Because T is a right module map, right B module map. Then what you get is that, uh, say, and this is nothing but uh, yes, yes, e ui star applied to eta a. Okay. Yeah. So this this equality shows that t is nothing but this element. Right. So having this lemma, then uh, I can I can make sense of this equality. <coughs> so there are two natural maps here. So let's consider this, okay, just, a, just algebraic B module tensor products. Then, by using the uh, universality of the tensor product, we have the following map. Since the joint projection commutes with uh, B, any element of B, so, and by using the universality of the tensor product, we have a linear map here. Okay. Actually, it's a, a bimodular map. Right. And uh, what I meant here is that this map is linear isomorphism. And namely, the inverse is given by, by this formula. Precisely. So given T in A1, then what you consider is the following Ti tensor B Ui. So this is an element of A tensor A. And the theorem says that. So this is a isomorphism, linear isomorphism. With, uh, well, this very explicit inverse. Actually, uh, We've already seen the one direction of the proof. 
for each one. So this is a, so starting from T, you go here. U I. Sorry. Can I take the U I star? U I star, yes. U I star. Right. So starting from T, so you you send T by this map here. Then you send by phi. Then you, what you get is this, right? So this is the identity. This is already done. And I think the other direction is also easy. So you start with an element like this. And then, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a few line computations I omitted. Right. So this means that the basic construction is, well, nothing but it. just a module tensor product over B. So the universality of the module tensor product, and now we, now we can introduce the dual, say, operator valued weight, not con. Well, First, you have to go through the operator value weight. Then, uh, using that, then we can introduce a dual conditional expectation. So, uh, so using this result, so definition, we can introduce this map. So, starting from A. The map from A1 to A, which sends X, E, Y to X, Y. And this is so-called a dual operator valued weight in the literature, in the type 3 subfactor literature. And this is very defined because A1 is an isomorphic to module tensor product. Right. And uh, actually, the Kosaki's idea is that okay, if you compute this, then you know that this is a one UI, UI star. This is one. And uh, then uh, by definition, you get this. And this is our definition of index, of the index of E. So the real story about the subfactors of type 3 factors is uh, the following. So this thing, this dual operator valued weight, was constructed by, by essentially by Hagerup. Hagerup theory of the operator valued weight with a, say, J operator. Then Kosaki noticed that in the case of type 2, 1 factors, then this number is nothing but, well, as you can see, the index of the subfactor. So Kosaki's approach is that, uh, well, let's, so let's take this as a definition of the index. Then starting from this formula, he developed the, the theory of subfactors, of type C factors. That's what Kosaki did. So starting from the fact that this is a finite, then you can, you can sh show that there exists a basis and so on and so on. Basic extension and so on and so on. That's what Kosaki did. But uh, now I reversed order. So from the beginning, I assume the existence of basis. Then now this becomes the theorem. Right. So, but uh, this is not a conditional expectation. It's not normalized. So we want to normalize it and to get a conditional expectation. And actually, it's possible. And, but for that, I should remark this. C 
So this is actually a positive map. Ah, yes. Uh, well, this is positive. So since it's, well, once you know that it's positive, then you automatically know that it's bounded, right? The norm is bounded by, norm we had is bounded by this element, norm of this element. Actually, from the definition, it's not at all clear whether this is positive or not, right? So you need to show something. And uh, actually, so uh, what we show is that, well, not only this is positive, but uh, well, we show that this is positive. And it's enough. So we show this. And uh, OK. Every element, yes. Yeah, that's, that should be easy. Right. So every element x in A1 have the following expression. Oh, yes. That's what uh, we've already seen. So let's consider this. Then this is uh, ij, xi, yi, ah, uh, yes, yi star. Oh, sorry, yj star, e, xj star. And uh, well, we use almost the same trick as before. We, when uh, we, sh we show that here's enough of inequality. So let's consider this part. Then, uh, well, as a matrix, this is a positive matrix. And since this belongs to B, so it commute with this uh, projection. So as a matrix, we have this inequality. So uh, let's put E here. We have this inequality as a matrix. Uh, in, in this algebra, MN, MN, uh, so this is A1, yes. You see? So this is a positive element, and E, e is a projection commuting with a positive element, so we have this inequality. So using that, this fact, then uh, we get, uh, yes. That is dominated by IJ and uh, yes, XI, Y, I, Y, J star, X, J star. And this is nothing but, this is nothing but E hat, uh, X, X star. Right. So, well, from the definition of this map, it's not clear that whether this is a positive or not is clear. But uh, by using this map, simply computation, you see that it's positive. So, definition, the dual conditional expectation So uh, since the dual operator by the weight is not not normal, so that we can normalize it. Then it's clear that well, already here it's clear that E hat is a bimodular map, and since this index is a central element, so this is still a bimodular map, and we already we saw that E hat is a positive map, 
So this is a E1 is also positive, and by thanks to this normalization, this is linear. So E1 is a conditional expectation. And this is called a dual conditional expectation. Okay. I still have 20 minutes. It's more than enough. Then the natural question is that uh, what? So we start from uh, the existence of a basis of E. So then we we constructed we. Well, we show that well, there is a nice theory of a basic construction. We get a dual conditional expectation. So na the natural question is whether this is a, of index finite type or not. So can you guess the right formula for the index? Uh, the, the, the basis of E1, it's a, it's a very easy exercise. And uh, in fact, well, it's easy computation. Actually, which I don't really remember, <laughs> so I should, I have to cheat, but anyway. So then, uh, okay, this is the right one, yeah? DR conditional expectation E1. Oh, it's easy computation. But this shows that, so when, okay, when this is a, well, in general, this is a central element, but the when it is a scalar. This is a scalar. Then the index of the dual conditional expectation is again the same as the one let's compute it. Ui. So since uh, we assume that this is a scalar, so you you can pull it out here. Star. And this shows that uh, it's the same as the uh, index <coughs> of E. Okay. So we get the same index for the dual conditional expectation. Any question up to here? So, uh, starting from the existence of basis, then uh, everything is fine for sister algebra. But of course, what you are interested in is the case of von Neumann algebra. So let so let me sh well, briefly explain the how okay, this construction is related to the, the case of the one in the von Neumann algebra. So when, let's assume A and B are forming algebra. Then usually you assume that E is a normal conditional expectation, meaning that uh, it is a right continuity property with some, some topology, say sigma weak topology, more precisely. Actually, it follows from the film snap of inequality, but anyway, let's assume it. Then uh, for basic construction, what you usually do is the following. So you fix a one faithful normal state. Then you extend it by using E. 
So this is affects normal phase through normal state of A. And uh, yes, then you consider the genus representation. And uh, for to perform the basic construction using for von Neumann algebras, then the usual definition is the following. So A, by using a DNS construction, so you represent A in this Hilbert space. Then what you do is that, uh, what you do is, right, Let's use this, this notation. You define the Jones projection this way. And the basic construction is by definition, say, uh, what's this? Okay, let's, let's Let's use this notice. Uh, so by definition, it's uh, okay. We closure of A, say pi A. The following miles are generated by this set. And well, it's easy to see that this is nothing but uh, the weak closure of this this space. Right, but the point is that, in fact, well, you don't really need to take a weak closure here. The reason is the following. Well, you can repeat the same argument as I did by using a basis. That's one way, but, uh, well, actually it follows from the following computation. So, okay, once you have a Hilbert B module, then you consider this tensor product. Then you take the closure. Well, there is a natural inner product in, in this linear space. Then you take closure and you get a and this is naturally identified with the GNS space of psi. And the identification is given by this map. Uh, okay. Say you identify this vector with the GNS vector, circuit vector of psi. Then this identification makes uh, actually two Hilbert spaces up. Not really identified. So on the okay, left hand side there's a natural representation A1 to B of and under this identification then this is identified with uh, B of H psi. And it's easy to see that, well, so this uh, actually pi come from the, uh, the action of A1 on this left tensor component. So there is a natural action here. Then you can easily see that you can identify this with the yes. Okay, the restriction pi to a one, pi to a is nothing but the DNS representation under this identification, and uh, the image of 
this projection is nothing but a joint projection in that sense. And moreover, you can see that, uh, uh, first of all, so, well, uh, well, to see that this is already, okay, to see that this is a, okay, this space is already a Fondheimer algebra, but I mean, that space without taking weak closure is a Fondheimer algebra. Actually, it's enough to it's enough to show that uh, well, this is already a fundamental algebra. But it's obvious because of this identification. Okay. From this identification, then the image of this tree is already a fundamental algebra. <coughs> Then, let's see, so this is M1. So M1 is, uh, since we have this, uh, okay. So let's suppress pi, it's, uh, let's suppress pi. Let me write this way. So this is, we know that this is one, so. You just uh, then this is U I E M one E J star. But uh, what from here, from this equation, well, this definition. So you already know that in this level. Well, well. At first point, of course, you have to take a weak closure, but since we know that this is just already a Fondheimer algebra, so you, you don't really need to take a weak closure. So it means that it is in A1. So this is already, so A1 is already a Fondheimer algebra. So everything is algebraic. So. Do you, do you need the first term? Because of the, so? the sum being equal to one. Huh? It is true for this case, A is A E A. You don't need A plus A E A. Yeah, in the end, you see that you don't really need this this component. Okay? But uh, why? Well, yes, of, from this definition, then a priori, this you you need this this term, but the facts, but this fact, so since this is the one, so you, you don't really need that term, yeah. Right, so I have 10, 10 minutes left. Yeah. I need one really important technical, technical reserve called the push down lemma, and it will appear every four almost everywhere in the, my next talks. Well, talks, yes, I guess I'll talk. So let me sketch that then. Huh? Push down then. So the situation is uh, as before. So we have a pair of sister algebras with a conditional expectation and a basis. So, so the push down, okay, push down lemma says the following. For any element x in A1, there is a unique element y in A satisfying, so this form. Uh, yes. This is so-called the push-down lemma of uh, Pimsna-Popper. 
and uh, actually the point the so I think in the third talk I'll present the sector the sector theory in this setting and uh, well um, you might think that you really need a whole type 3 theory to, to talk about sectors and so on and so on but it's not really necessary but the only point is this push down map I'll show that to develop the type of a sector theory for type 3 factors the only point is the push down them and the fact that uh, any two non zero projections are equivalent. That's all. So you don't really need Tomita attack like theory and so on. That's why I'm, I'm doing everything algebraically today. So. And the proof is easy, really easy, because, well, uh, for the uniqueness, once you have, if, once you have this equation, Once you have this inequality, then you apply the dual conditional expectation. You get this, so this shows the y. If there is such y, then y should be of this form. So this is a uniqueness part. And the equidistance part is also, since we, we have a basis, so also easy. Because well, x can be expressed as a following. Uh, x uh, a, a i, p i. Yes. You know, you're showing the sister algebra situation. So yeah, 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 sister algebra. So the one dollar index is just the inverse of the central element. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, it's inverse of central element, but it's uh, it's the uh, it's larger than one. It's invertible. So, so x can be expressed in this form. So this product is uh, AI, uh, yes, PI, D. E. So this shows that, uh, yes, so this part is Y. So this is a push-down rim. I use it uh, in a crucial way. So, so I have five minutes left. So I'll talk about uh, what I am going. To. So tomorrow, I, well, tomorrow I, I will not give a talk. Yeah. Day after, okay. So I'm talk. I'll say a few words about uh, what I will do next time. So. So today I, sh I show that, uh, while well, starting from a conditional expectation with a basis, then there is a very nice theory of uh, index and basic construction and so on and so on. But in the case of a type 2 1 factor, there is a canonical conditional expectation, which is a trace preserving one. But in general, there is no canonical conditional expectation in that sense. But, say, in the case of factors, say, when A and B are factors, or let's say when A and B are simple sister algebras, there is also a canonical conditional expectation in a different sense, which is called the minimal conditional expectation. So the index really depends on the, the choice of conditional expectation, but there is a very special one which minimizes all the possible values of index. That's a minimal conditional expectation. But unfortunately, well, even in the case of a type 2 1 factor, the minimal conditional expectation does not coincide with the trace preserving one in a very strange situation. In the, well, more precisely, in the case where the, the inclusion, the subfactor is not extreme, which Bond didn't talk about, 
then there's a two conditional expectations so not really coincide. And uh, well, I guess uh, there is a discussion about uh, which is a better conditional expectation in that situation. Well, I should say that uh, well, non-extremal inclusions are really strange ones. <laughs> We, we don't need to decide which is better. <laughs> but there is a point. There is a point which uh, I really want to stick to the minimal conditional expectation. Namely, the reason is the following. So it's a, it's a problem versus index. Okay. Index and, uh, say, dimension, square root of index. So this is a, so uh, as you saw in an example, this is a quantity something like the, the cardinality of the group, finite group. But on the other hand, this is, the square root of the index is a, how to say, it's something like a dimension. So if you look at, uh, say, Wasserman type subfactors, well, which, well, probably I, I'll talk about at some more point. Then this corresponds to the dimension of the representation. So, well, I guess Bohm, Bohm believed that this is a nat more natural than the other one. But uh, my, you know, I believe that uh, this is a better, this somehow behaves better. Yeah. And the, the first one, one, of the, one of the ways the cyclotomic integer and the other one <laughs> right, that's also like. But uh, the point is that, okay, tomorrow I show that, uh, okay, when, okay, this inclusion is uh, not irreducible, so it's not, so the relative commutator is not a scalar. Then you want to, you want to compute the local index, namely, so you take a, say, partition of unity consisting of a minimal projection. Pi minimal minimal projection. Then you want to compute the index of this. So this is so-called the local index. So it turns out that this. This quantity behaves well. I mean, the, for, for local index, then the square root is better. The reason is that, so if you use the minimal conditional expectation to define the index of subact, then you have this additivity property for the, for the square root of the index. And uh, index index well, doesn't have this addit additivity property. Well, on the right, you mean minimal index. Yeah, for the minimal index, yes, this is the case. On the left, they are automatically uh, minimal. Oh, yeah. So, in my definition, the, 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 this index is uh, the defined in terms of minimal conditional expectation. <laughs> for the minimal conditional expectation, then you have this additive property for the dimension and square root of the index. So, well, on the left, it's the ordinary index anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, I stop here.